Hello and welcome to lecture 28 of uh, analog integrated circuit design. We were looking at uh, performance of basic amplifiers in presence of parasitics, basically the high frequency performance of uh, the basic amplifier stages. We looked at what happens in a common drain amplifier and a common gate amplifier. Now, uh, we will look at the common source amplifier in this lecture. Now, this is the small signal model of the common source amplifier including the transistor parasitics that we drew yesterday. Now, the C D B parasitic appears across C L and C G D and C G S are here. We also saw that it has a close correspondence to the Miller op amp that we analyzed earlier. Okay. In fact, later when we do the implementation, we will see that the Miller op amp is formed around a common source amplifier as well. Okay. We have the same network of three capacitors C 1, C and C L which are analogous to C G S, C G D and C L prime. We have some conductance here G O 2 which is analogous to G L prime, G O 1 which is analogous to G S and this transconductance G M 2 is analogous to this G M okay. and it is in the same polarity because if I increase the, this node current will be drawn into G M 2. So, if I increase the gate node the current will be drawn into this G M. Okay. Now, the only other difference is what happens with the input before we have v, we had V e which provided a current of G m 1 V e in this direction through the transconductance G m 1. Now, we have an input of V s, but the transformed input source is a current source V s G s which pushes into the node. Okay. So, this V s G s is analogous to minus G m 1 V e. Okay. So, let me write out the corresponding terms. V s G s in the new circuit is like minus G m 1 V e in the old circuit okay. and C l prime is like C l and C g s is C 1, C g d is C and G m is G m 2. Okay. Now, because we have already done the analysis, I am not going to repeat it and we saw that V naught by V e was something that had a single 0 and 2 poles. Okay. So, this is the expression we had and all we have to do is to substitute the corresponding terms. I will not worry about the others that we can do very easily. The only one thing is first I will write out the expression for V naught which will be G m 1 times V e and G m 1 times V e has to be substituted by minus V s G s. Okay. I want the transfer function now I will divide both sides by V s. So, I will have minus G s over there. Now, by the way uh, just as a practice for circuit analysis I suggest that you put down this circuit and then do the analysis and make sure that you get exactly the same answers as before. Okay. This is more of a drill exercise because we have already done the analysis, but nonetheless do the nodal analysis again and make sure that you get this expression. Okay. So, G m 2 is G m and this S c is S c G d. Okay. And this expression will be C G S C G D plus C G D C L prime plus C L prime C G S. Okay. So, by the way I put C G D here this was originally C it is C G D and this will be G M plus G S plus G L prime. 
So, this L prime G s and this is C G s G L prime okay. and finally, we will have G s G L prime. Okay. So, that is the expression for V naught by V s in a common source amplifier including the parasitic capacitances. Okay. Now, first of all it is very obvious that if you look at only the DC terms, we will have uh, minus G s times G m divided by G s times G l prime or minus G m by G l prime. Okay. This is a very familiar minus G m R l formula for the gain of a common source amplifier that is true okay. and the rest of it the poles and zeros will be analyzed in exactly the same way as we did the Miller amplifier. Okay. We see that there is a right half plane pole at plus G m by C G D okay. and this has the usual effects of uh, extra phase shift and so on and there will be two poles which are uh, as before. So, the pole associated with the input node of the common source amplifier will be related to G s. Okay. this will be the pole. By the way, first of all this is an approximation, it is obtained by approximating the quadratic equation into two linear equations assuming that the poles are far from each other. If not this approximation is not valid okay. and a further approximation tells you that it is roughly like having the conductance G s at the input in parallel with C G s and Miller multiplied C G D. Okay. If you imagine a MOS transistor without C G D, the pole would be simply at uh, minus G s by C G s and the other pole will would be at minus G l prime by C l prime. Okay. Now, because we have C G D, we will have this modification okay. just for uh, easy comparison. Let me put down what happens without C G D this would have been minus G s by C G s that is all and similarly the pole associated with the output conductance would be some conductance which is the sum of the G l prime that exists plus the conductance due to this G m being in feedback which is G m times this capacitive divider ratio. Okay. And there will be some other uh, minor term associated with G s which I am going to ignore. Okay. You would uh, get something like G s times C G D plus C L by C G D plus C G s. Okay. This usually can be safely ignored as long as G s is sufficiently small. In the denominator we will have C L prime plus the series combination of C G D and C G S. Okay. So, exactly the same as before and with the same intuitive explanations and to understand this even better we will put down the value without C G D and that would be simply minus G L prime by C L prime. Okay. So, with the conductance G S we had a capacitance C G S, now we have C G S plus Miller multiplied C G D. So, this moves to lower frequencies and here with a conductance G L prime we had a capacitance C L prime. Now, with a conductance G L prime plus G M times some uh, fraction we have a capacitance C L prime plus some small capacitor C G D in series with C G S. Okay. So, this typically goes to higher frequencies. Okay. So, the larger the value of C G D the greater this effect and we saw that this effect was called uh, 
pole splitting okay if we didn't have ccd the input and the output of the common source amplifier are isolated from each other okay we have a pole at the input we have a pole at the output the input pole is not influenced by what's happening to the load the output node pole is not uh, influenced by what's happening with the source resistance and so on but now we have coupling okay so ccd introduces coupling between the input and output nodes clearly pole associated with the input node is influenced by the load by the gain okay we have gm by gl prime here and the pole associated with the output node is also influenced by ccd because ccd introduces feedback around gm and that significantly influences the pole okay so the input and output are no longer well isolated when you have ccd and this is what i remarked when i was discussing the common gate amplifier that common gate amplifier is one in which the input and output are very well isolated and that is sometimes the reason for using a common uh, gate amplifier it has a current gain of only one right but it's a way of providing a current while providing isolation between the input and output we'll see more of that later okay so this is the summary of the common source amplifier there will be pole splitting due to ccd now we can analyze more complicated situations where the load is not merely capacitive but inductive and so on it turns out that in such cases the coupling introduced by ccd can also introduce instability we will not worry about that for now okay now let's revisit the common drain amplifier we analyze the common drain amplifier for dc as well as including parasitics but when we included the parasitics we didn't include the source resistance okay i assume that the common drain amplifier was driven like this okay this is the bulk drain source gate okay this is gm gmb gds ccd ccs cdb csb okay as usual uh, we will absorb the capacitances and reduce the number so we have uh, cl prime to be csb plus cl and cdb prime has no effect because it's between two fixed voltages okay now in reality we will also have a resistance rs okay and finally this conductance gmb is between this point and ground and the controlling voltage is also between this point and ground so this can be simply replaced by a conductance gmb which finally means that we can have an effective load conductance which is gl plus gmb plus gds okay now let me uh, reduce this picture i'll have something like this when i said reduce the picture i mean reduce the clutter and the number of uh, components that we have cgs gm and CGD will be here, okay, and this point is grounded, and I'll have GL prime and CL prime with the appropriate values, okay. So this is the small signal picture of a common drain amplifier. Now this can be analyzed, but uh, my point was again how uh, useful the analysis we did earlier with the Miller op-amp was, okay. So let me redraw that. I have GM one, 
with V e applied this way. So, this draws a current G m 1 V e okay, C 1 and the conductance G o 1 is over here. There is the C, C L and G O 2. Okay. Now, if you look at this particular picture, it also has a loop of three capacitances C G D, C G S and G L prime okay. and this is gate, drain and source. Now, if I had to make a correspondence between uh, the nodes in the upper and lower circuits, I would uh, say this is the gate and this is the source and the ground is the drain. Okay. And also let me transform this source as I did for the common source amplifier. I will have a source V s G s. Okay. So, again you see that the analysis we did for the Miller op amp can be used as is for the uh, common drain amplifier. Okay. Now, what are the other differences? First of all, this G m goes from drain to source and also it is not dependent on the voltage between this G and ground, but between G and source. Okay. So, I can replace that with two uh, transconductances. So, this is G m V G s. right? So, let me make it G m V G in this direction and G m V s in that direction. Okay. And you also notice that for this control source, the controlling voltage is across the control source itself. So, it can be replaced with a conductance G m. Okay. Then the correspondence becomes exact. This control source is controlled by the voltage between this point and ground just like this one. Only when the voltage increases, it pushes current into this node whereas here when this voltage increases, it pulls current from that node. Okay. So, the correspondence are the corresponding quantities are first of all V s G s in the common drain amplifier is like minus G m 1 V e, C G d is like C 1, C G s is like C, C l prime is like C l. Okay. I had omitted the source resistance here, this is G s the source conductance, G s is like G o 1 and G l prime plus G m is like G O 2. Okay. So, again by using the analysis we did earlier for the Miller amplifier and substituting with, with the appropriate terms, we can get uh, the detailed answers for the common drain amplifier including a source resistance. I am not going to do it here, please do that and make sure that first of all you have consistent results with uh, what we analyzed before that is only the DC analysis and when R s is 0. Okay. And then you can also see that you will have two poles and a 0, you can compute the poles and zeros approximately and see how the whole thing behaves. Okay. It is also important to intuitively explain to yourself why the gain behaves the way it does like for instance what happens in the low frequency limit, what happens in the high frequency limit and so on. Okay. So, we have uh, reviewed the basic amplifier stages, the common source, common gate and common drain amplifiers, we know how they behave. Um, each of them gives you at least one pole, probably two poles and sometimes a 0 as well. Okay. And this will uh, come into play when we uh, realize more complicated amplifiers. Now, it turns out that when we go to more and more complicated amplifiers, we cannot go on with this uh, business of uh, writing node equations and analyzing them. It is possible, but the expressions will be so complicated that you would not get any insight into them. So, you have to be able to recognize individual stages see how they behave under different conditions, make suitable approximations and get the answers for the entire circuit. Okay. Otherwise, we will not be able to design any circuit more complicated than a single transistor circuit. Okay. 
will soon uh, go into multi stage amplifiers and so on. And there is no way we can write out third, fourth, fifth order uh, uh, transfer functions. First of all, it is hard to evaluate, and more importantly, even if you did so, uh, it will be useless because it won't give you any intuition. Okay, so you draw intuition from uh, the analysis of basic circuits and applying it appropriately to the more complicated circuits. And when you want exact answers, you go to a simulator, calculate it, and reconcile it with the intuitive results that you've got. Okay. Now the next topic of uh, importance after finishing the basic amplifier stages is yet another basic stage which uh, many of you would be familiar with it is the differential pair. Now why is this uh, relevant at all let us go back to the most basic op amp that we have. What does it have? It has a transconductor GM and a capacitor C and the input is a difference input VE that is there are two inputs with respect to ground and the circuit responds to the difference between the two voltages. Okay. If I call this VP and VM it responds to VP minus VM. So we need to have a circuit topology that will amplify the difference between these two stages. Okay. what is it that uh, we can use first of all we need to have a high dc gain in fact infinity okay we know that the dc gain of this is gm by go1 and it should approach infinity ideally so how would we uh, design an amplifier that has a very large gain so let's start with the basic amplifiers that we know that is the common source common drain and common gate amplifiers okay First of all, a uh, common drain amplifier is ruled out because it has a voltage gain of 1 and common gate amplifier it is also ruled out because you see here the inputs VP and VM should look at high impedance inputs that is no current should be drawn from here in order not to interfere with those voltages at least that is the assumptions with which we designed the negative feedback circuit prototype. Okay. So, we will still assume that that is what we want. So, the only thing that gives you a high gain and a high input resistance at one port is a common source amplifier. Okay. Now, what does the common source amplifier amplify? It amplifies the difference between VP and VM okay. and let me ignore GDS for now. So, the current here will be GM times VP minus VM if you pass it through a resistance you can obtain an output voltage which is gmr times vp minus vm negative of that okay now one of the things that you immediately see is that the what is seen by vp and what is seen by vm are very different okay if i draw this circuit with only vp I get this and the resistance looking in there is infinity. If I draw the circuit with only V m I really have a common gate amplifier here right and the resistance looking up there is 1 over G m which is very low. I already said that we would like to sense the difference between the input and feedback without disturbing them okay that's what is desirable in a negative feedback system so this is okay this is not okay and we have to fix it okay now what should we do to fix that first of all uh, what you what would you do if you have a low impedance to drive but you would like to see a high impedance the obvious answer is the voltage buffer that's the purpose of the voltage buffer if you have a heavy load but you do not want to present a heavy load to the input source you insert a voltage buffer in between. Okay. So, I should not do this but what I should really do is insert a voltage buffer and have Vm over there. Now, what is the voltage buffer topology that I am familiar with from basic uh, transistor amplifiers the only thing that I know is a common drain amplifier or the source follower okay 
and it looks something like that. So, this is the common drain amplifier. If I have V m here, I will get a buffered version of V m over there. So, I can try to use this in that circuit and try to make my amplifier which amplifies the difference between V p and V m. Let me put it down here. This is my amplifier and I have V p and I would have wanted V m here, but because it looks at a very low input resistance, I would do not want V m, but a buffered version of V m. And how do I get a buffered version of V m? Using a source follower and I will just turn it, draw the mirror image of it, so that it is convenient to draw. Okay. So, this is the source follower biased with some current source and the drain is connected to V D D. Okay. So, this is what I will have. Now, I expect that here I get something proportional to V P minus V M. Let us say if I really get that. Okay. So, let me put the current source in the middle okay. and V P and V M are really small signal voltages. I will assume that they have some bias voltage plus V p and bias voltage plus V m. Okay. And let me call this m 1 and m 2 and in all my initial analysis I will assume that there is no G d s that is the transistor is simply represented by G m. I okay. will also ignore body effect for now, we will later see what it does to this circuit. Okay. Now, what happens? First of all, what is the quiescent condition or the operating point? At the quiescent condition, V p and V m are both 0. So, I have V bias and V bias over there. And clearly, the V g s of m 1 and V g s of m 2 are equal to each other in this condition. So, if they are equal to each other, these two currents have to be equal to each other. Remember, we have assumed no GDS which means that V d s has no influence on the drain currents. So, these two will be equal and since the sum of them has to be equal to I naught, each of them equals I naught by 2. Okay. And if I connect this to some supply voltage V d d, this will be at a voltage V d d minus I naught R by 2 and let us also assume that all transistors are operating in saturation region. Okay. That is some basic assumption that we make everywhere, because the transconductance of the transistors is highest in the saturation region and also the conductance G d s is lowest in the saturation region. That is the preferred region of operation for amplifiers. Okay. So, the quiescent operating point is set. Now, at that operating point, these two transistors will have some transconductance because the operating points are identical, the transconductances also will be identical, and I will call that GM1. Okay. So, when I draw the small signal picture, this is what I will have the input here is VP, the small signal input. The input here is V m and I have R over there and nothing over here. This is where my output is. Okay. This is G m times, let me call this V x, this is G m times V p minus V x, this is G m 1 times V m minus V x. So, at this node I have G m 1 times V p minus V x plus G m 1 times V m minus V x equal to 0. So, V x obviously equals V p plus V m divided by 2. Okay. 
So, this means that across these two terminals I have V p minus V m by 2 and across these two I have V m minus V p by 2. Okay. So, the incremental current here which is the same as the incremental current in the opposite direction in the other transistor will be equal to G m times V p minus V m by 2. Okay. So, as expected we have got a small signal current that is proportional to V p minus V m and that flows into the load resistance R and we will have an output voltage that is G m R by 2 times V p minus V m. Now, in our original common source amplifier the case where we applied uh, V p to the gate and V m to the source we would have expected a, an incremental current of G m times V p minus V m, but uh, the important thing here is that we are driving the source with an imperfect buffer. Okay. The buffer's output resistance is not 0, okay. it is equal to 1 by G m of that transistor. M 2 is being used as a buffer according to our uh, viewpoint and its output resistance is 1 over G m of that transistor. So, first of all the common source amplifier its source is not exactly at ground, it is connected to ground through a small resistance 1 by G m that is why the gain from V p to the output changes and also as far as the buffer is concerned it is not terminated by a very high impedance, it is terminated by uh, 1 over G m as we will see. Okay. So, V m does not appear at the source of M 2 with a gain of 1, in fact it appears with a gain of half as we have seen here it is V p minus V m by 2. Okay. So, because of these reasons the gain of this uh, amplifier is uh, G m r by 2 times V p minus V m, but that is perfectly fine what we wanted was something proportional to V p minus V m and that is what we have here. Okay. I have a current I naught R and I apply V bias plus V p V bias plus V m. In the quiescent condition I have I naught by 2 I naught by 2 this is m 1 that is m 2 and the small signal output voltage will be minus G m R by 2 V p minus V m. Okay. And the quiescent output voltage will be V d d minus I naught r by 2. Okay. So, that is the total voltage at the output and we have a small signal output voltage that is an amplified version of V p minus V m. Okay. Now, this is equivalent to having a transconductance with some output resistance. Okay. This is G m 1, G o 1 and it should be connected to a capacitor. Ideally, we would like to have no G O 1, but uh, we have to have some resistance here to bias the circuit as well as convert the output current to a voltage. Okay. So, we will end up having a DC gain of G M 1 by G O 1 here, which basically is G M R by 2 in our case. Okay. Now, if you observe this circuit, it is obviously symmetrical with respect to M 1 and M 2, meaning the entire circuit is not symmetrical. We have a resistance R connected to the drain of M 1 and not M 2, but the quiescent uh, condition is symmetrical and we could as well have uh, connected R to M 2. Now, what will happen? The currents will be exactly the same as before. Let us say this is V bias plus V p and that is V bias plus V m and this output would be remember this current here the incremental current here was G m by 2 times V p minus V m. Okay. So, the output voltage here incrementally would be G m r by 2 V p minus V m. 
okay it is symmetrical after all it is simply like interchanging V p and V m in this circuit okay. So, I could do that as well in that case I get a gain of plus g m r by 2 instead of minus g m r by 2 and obviously in this circuit I can also do this I can connect another resistor here and at this point I will get minus g m r by 2 V p minus V m okay. And if I take the difference between these two nodes, I will have GMR VP minus VM. So, our efforts to obtain some output related to the difference between VP and VM has given us this particular circuit, right. The way we started off with was a common source amplifier because that was the only thing that we knew which could give an appreciable gain and we knew that it amplifies the difference between gate and source. So, we connected one of the voltages to the gate other one to the source, but the impedance looking into the source was very low. So, instead of connecting it directly we connected it through a source pullover okay. And when we put down the whole circuit we came up with this circuit which has two transistors M1 and M2 and the current in the two transistors is related to the difference Vp minus Vm okay. Now, this current can be integrated in a capacitor uh, and in this case for uh, biasing reasons we need a resistor as well, but uh, this is a circuit that can be used for our op amp okay. at least as a first cut circuit for our op amp. And this circuit as you most likely are already familiar with is the differential pair. Okay. it is the differential pair and this is an interesting circuit uh, by itself and we will analyze it in some detail before we go on to design op amps with it. We will consider the completely symmetrical circuit that we put down last where we have a resistance R in the drain of uh, both transistors M1 and M2 okay. And it is biased with the current source and this current source is uh, usually called the tail current source. This is the differential pair okay, this is a symmetrically loaded differential pair that we have here and this node of the differential pair is known as the tail node. And it is being driven by voltages V bias plus V p and V bias plus V m, some voltage on the two sides. Okay. Now, how would we analyze the circuit? We need to do both large signal and small signal analysis. We have already done the small signal analysis, but we need to put down some more details. Now, first of all as usual we have assumed that the GDS of these transistors is 0. Okay, and it has an ideal current source biasing the tail node right. Now, the first thing I will do is write this V p and V m as the average value plus minus half the difference value okay. and this average value is known as the common mode voltage and this is known as the differential 
voltage okay vp minus vm is the differential voltage and this is half of the differential voltage okay now the reason i do that is let me again rewrite this as uh, v bias plus v average plus half the difference voltage and here I will write it as V bias plus V average minus half the difference voltage. Now, it is very obvious that V average has no influence on this circuit okay? because let us say the difference voltage was 0 and you have some V average. So, you have V bias plus V average on uh, the left side and V bias plus V average on the right side as well. Okay? Now, what is the effect of V average? It is nothing because the VGS of M1 and M2 are still identical to each other okay? and the sum of currents in M1 and M2 equals I0. So, whatever the value of V average, if the current source is ideal, the current in each of these transistors will be equal to I0 by 2. Okay? Now, later we will see that when the current source is not ideal, V, v average will have some influence, but uh, for now I will ignore that okay? because it has no influence at all on this circuit. So, I will consider inputs that are applied anti-symmetrically like this V d by 2 on the left side and minus V d by 2 on the right side okay? and with this we can do our analysis. The small signal analysis we have already done that is we end up with a voltage of G m r by 2 times V p minus V m which means that this is G m r times V d by 2 and minus g m r times v d by 2. Okay. Now, we will do the large signal analysis of the differential pair What I will do is I will try and plot the currents I1 and I2 flowing in the two transistors M1 and M2. Okay. Now, what happens? What do we expect? If uh, Vd by 2 is positive, then Vgs of M1 is uh, more than the Vgs of M2, and so I1 will be more than I2. And similarly, when uh, Vd is negative, Vgs of M1 is less than the Vgs of M2 and I 1 will be less than I 2. When V d equals 0, we know that I 1 and I 2 both equal I 0 by 2. Okay. And what I would like to do is to plot uh, the currents I 1, I 2 as a function of V d and I know that at this point when V d equals 0, both are equal to I 0 by 2. Now, what happens for uh, very small values of V d? Now, for very small values of V d, we are deviating very uh, small, we are deviating to a very small extent from the operating point. So, the small signal analysis will hold. Okay. Now, what are the incremental currents? The current in M 1 was I 0 by 2 that is the quiescent current plus G m by 2 times V p minus uh, uh, V m which is V d. Okay and the current in M2 is simply this with a minus sign. So, what will happen is for small values of V d, there will be straight lines with a slope of uh, G m by 2 or uh, minus G m by 2 depending on whether we are talking about I 1 or I 2. Okay when V d is very small. Now, what do we expect to happen when V d is very large? Okay. As V d becomes larger and larger, 
this uh, VGS of M1 becomes larger and larger. Now, at some point it will become so large that the current corresponding to that will be equal to I naught. Okay. We know that uh, in the quiescent condition M1 draws a current I naught by 2 and as you increase VGS it will increase from I naught by 2 and at some point the current in the transistor uh, M1 will be equal to I naught. So, obviously at that point the current in uh, the transistor M2 will be equal to 0. Okay. So, the transistor M2 cuts off and for any increase in VD beyond this point the transistor M2 cannot have a current that is less than 0. Okay. So, it will continue to have a current of 0 and transistor M1 will continue to have a current of I naught. Okay. Now, what is the voltage at which this will happen? This will happen when the VGS of this is just equal to the value required to carry I naught. Okay. The quiescent VGS of uh, M1 and M2 equals Vt plus square root 2 times the current which is I naught by 2 square root of 2 times I naught by 2 divided by mu C ox W by L. Okay. Now, VGS of M1 at a current of I naught is V t plus square root 2 times I naught by mu C ox W by L. Okay. So, this is the overdrive voltage when in the quiescent condition and this is the overdrive voltage in the condition when all of I naught is flowing through M 1. Okay. Now, what is the VGS of M2 in this condition? M1 is just uh, carrying I naught. Okay. When I say M1 is carrying I naught, what I mean is the value of uh, VD has been increased such that the current in M1 just reaches I naught and the current in M2 just reaches 0. So, when the current in M2 just reaches 0, its uh, gate source voltage will be equal to V t. Okay. So, the difference voltage between these two will be simply equal to square root of 2 I naught by mu C ox W by L. Okay. So, at a current at a voltage equal to square root 2 I naught by mu C ox W by L, the current in M 1 will reach I naught and current in M 2 will reach 0 and the circuit is symmetrical. So, at a voltage equal to minus square root 2 I naught by mu C ox W by L, the current in M 1 will reach 0 and the current in M 2 will reach I naught and in the middle they will do something non linear like this okay, and then go they are linear close to the uh, point where V d equals 0 and beyond that they are non linear. Okay. Now, the main lesson to take home from this is when the differential pair is operated with a small difference voltage then the currents are linearly related to the difference. Okay. This is important and this is what we will use in our op amp design. In fact, we came up with the differential pair as a means of uh, uh, having some current that responds to difference between two voltages and also presents a very high impedance to both the voltage sources. Okay. Now, uh, when the difference voltage V d becomes very large, what happens is the circuit starts becoming nonlinear, just like any other circuit and for a large enough V d the currents in the transistors will become constant. All of the tail current will flow into either M1 or M2 and the other transistor will carry 0. Now, this will become important to study some of the non-idealities of the op amp and maybe some other circuits as well. Okay. We will see all those details later, but in the next few lectures we will look at how to make the op amp using the differential pair. Thank you.